Following Capcom's 20th anniversary of the Monster Hunter series, I decided to play the first game, 2004's Monster Hunter for the PlayStation 2. Hi, I'm Asteria, and I've been playing Monster Hunter games for over 10 years now. In this video, I'm gonna talk about how the first Monster Hunter game came to be, I'm gonna talk about my first experience with the series, I'm gonna play through the game, and at the end of the video, I'm gonna give you my thoughts on the game and on the series as a whole. And there's also something really cool at the end of the video, so watch until the end if you're interested in knowing what that is. So let's start, shall we? This is Monster Hunter for the PlayStation 2. Just to get this out of the way, if you guys like my content, please leave a like, subscribe, and ring the bell. It would really help my channel, and you would get notified of all of my uploads. And also, if you're interested in becoming a member of my channel, that would be awesome. Being able to use emojis when I livestream, special Discord rules for each membership level on my Discord server, and most importantly, getting a shoutout at the end of each video, are just some of the perks that come with becoming a member. Thank you so much, now let's get back to the video. In the beginning of the 21st century, Capcom had a vision to develop three network-focused games for the PlayStation 2. Alongside titles like Auto Modelista and Resident Evil Outbreak, Monster Hunter was born as part of this ambitious initiative. Capcom had high hopes for these games, aiming for at least one to sell a million copies. Out of the three, Monster Hunter and Resident Evil Outbreak managed to hit that million mark. 20 years later, the Monster Hunter series has never been stronger. 2018's Monster Hunter World pushed the series and the company to another stratosphere. Monster Hunter World has sold over 25 million units, a monumental feat for Capcom and for action RPGs in general. But I'm not here to talk about Monster Hunter World. I'm here to talk about Monster Hunter, the first game in a series. But first let me talk about how I got into Monster Hunter. You see, back in 2011, I bought the game that pretty much had the biggest impact in my life. That game was Monster Hunter Freedom Unite for the Sony PSP. Monster Hunter Freedom Unite was my very first Monster Hunter game. From the weapons, to the armors, to the monsters, even to the most insignificant details. Like how each feline companion has a different temperament and weapon choice. And I must not forget about the soundtrack for this game. The Poke Village song is just... chef's kiss. This was the game that made me fall in love with the series. Generation 2 is probably my favorite generation of Monster Hunter, but I'm afraid that I cannot say the same about Generation 1. I do like some stuff about this game though. The soundtrack is amazing. Rathalos and Rathian are great monsters, and I really like the village and the vibe they created with it. But the game isn't known for that. Monster Hunter 1 is oftentimes considered to be the most hardcore game in the Monster Hunter series. Not having a farm in the village like in Monster Hunter Freedom 1 to help you with grinding certain materials, not having access to the gathering hall quests like in later sequels, and the most obvious of all, the controls. These are just some of the reasons why the game is considered to be the hardest in the series. I've already completed Monster Hunter Freedom 1, but I think that beating Monster Hunter 1 is going to be the real challenge. So join me as I struggle through the controls, the environment, and the quests as we try to beat Monster Hunter 1 20 years later after its release. This is going to be interesting. Before we start playing the actual game, I just want to show you the basic controls first. I'm gonna use the Greatsword as an example. If you're not interested in the controls, you can skip this part if you want. But I recommend you sticking around because the control layout for this game is kinda wild. See what I did there? You move around using the left analog stick, which is common in most games, and you run by pressing R2. Also, I'd recommend you using the L1 button to center your camera. To unsheathe your weapon, flick the right analog stick in any direction. Flicking the right analog stick up does a basic attack. Flicking it to the right or down does an upswing attack, and flicking it to the left does a side slash. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. You move the camera by pressing any direction on the D-pad, which is almost impossible to do while fighting a monster. Which is why I recommend you using the L1 button to center your camera. To block a monster's attack, press the R1 button. To grab a ledge, gather, or carve a monster, press the X button. If you're in a pickle and need to dodge, press the circle button. To use any consumable in the game, such as a whetstone, press the square button. To choose another consumable, keep the L2 button pressed and cycle through the items using the square or circle button. The select button can have multiple uses. In this situation, pressing the select button can zoom in on the map. 
Open the menu by pressing the start button. Choose items and then press select. In this situation, the select button can be used to sort your items. And then there's the greatsword meme kick. If you press R3, you can actually do a kick animation, which actually does damage to monsters. It's really funny. Those are the controls for this game. As you can see, they're a bit complicated, but in my experience, you can actually get used to them quite quickly. It's not that bad, guys. They could be way, way worse. But now with the controls out of the way, let's talk about the weapon types featured in this game. Seeing as it's the first Monster Hunter game, it's obvious that the weapon variety would be kind of limited, but there's still a good quantity of weapons for this game. There's a total of 7 weapon types in Monster Hunter 1. The Blade Master weapons are composed of the Greatsword, Sword and Shield, Dual Blades, the Hammer, and the Lance. And the Gunner weapons are composed of the Light Bowgun and the Heavy Bowgun. Obviously, having two distinct classes of weapons in this game means that there are different armors for these classes, right? You're 100% correct. Blade Master and Gunner armors have been a thing since the beginning of the series, with each armor having specific skills and attributes. If you choose to use Blade Master weapons in this game though, you have to use Whetstones, which are a consumable item that sharpens your weapon. None of that unlimited stuff from World. You know, actually, let's talk about sharpness in this game. Sharpness in this game is a crucial mechanic. Most weapons that you craft or buy in the beginning of the game are either red, orange, or yellow sharpness weapons. You should always sharpen your weapons. Sharpening your weapon regains your initial sharpness level. The higher the sharpness level, the less likely you're to bounce, and the more effective your attacks will be. This is a no-brainer if you played a Monster Hunter game before, but in this game, attacking a monster with orange sharpness, or god forbid, Red sharpness can either not give you enough attack power or make you just bounce all over the place. Having a lower sharpness weapon will just be a nightmare in fights where monsters have a harder carapace. So please sharpen your weapons, please. This was actually something that kind of shocked me. There are only four sharpness levels in this game. There's red, orange, yellow, and green. Green is the highest sharpness level in this game. You know, having played other Monster Hunters, especially Freedom Unite, which was like one gen after this one, you can clearly see the improvements that they made to sharpness levels were really important for the games. Anyway, let's talk about Gunner and Blade Master weapons. I'm not much of a gunner myself, but I can tell you that if you choose gunner weapons in this game, be prepared to grind for your bullets while grinding for your consumables as well. There's already so much grinding for items in this game, so being a gunner in this game, I just cannot imagine it. I play with blade master weapons and I, I just got bored in the beginning of the game, just grinding to make my potions. So I can just imagine how boring it must be to be a gunner in this game. As I said in the beginning of the video, there are two types of gunner weapons, light and heavy bowguns. The type of bowgun that you use really doesn't matter, but if you're good at dodging with heavier weapons, I'd go with the heavy bowgun. Heavy bowguns might be slower compared to light bowguns, but they have more attack. Also, you should always check what kind of ammo a bowgun can take before buying it. Anyway, let's go over some essential items for gunners in this game. The essential items for gunners are bullets, obviously, and barrel bombs. Basic ammo in this game are composed of normal bullets, pierce, pellet, crag, clust, and disc, which is a special disc-shaped ammo that can ricochet for extra hits. Status effect bullets include poison, stun, and sleep. There are also support type bullets that can be used in multiplayer. These include recovery bullets, antidote bullets, demon, and armor, which momentarily increases the attack and defense of other players. Other bullets include Paint S, which is basically a paintball but for gunners, Dung S, which are bullets that repel monsters, and there's also Dragon S bullets which cannot be used in regular bowguns. Barrel bombs have been an essential item for like 20 years now. Everyone knows barrel bombs, right? You have small barrel bombs and you have big barrel bombs. That's pretty much it. In order to explode a large barrel bomb, place a small barrel bomb next to it and wait. The best use for bombs is using them while a monster is trapped. Place them close to their head for maximum damage. But that's pretty much it regarding gunner stuff. Let's talk about blade master weapons next. There are three damage types for blade master weapons. Slashing, 
piercing and impact damage. The sword and shield, greatsword and dual blades deal slashing damage to monsters, the lance deals piercing damage and the hammer deals impact damage. All weapons with slash damage can cut tails, the lance in later games can cut tails as well, but I haven't played with the lance enough times to know if it does that here as well. Later in the video, in my playthrough of this game, you're going to see a lot of great sword gameplay. That's my main weapon in most Monster Hunter games, but I've also played with the sword and shield, hammer and lance weapons in this game. The only weapon that I haven't tried out yet is the dual blades. The dual blades don't have their own weapon tree in this game. To craft a dual blade weapon, you need to have a sword and shield weapon that has a dual blade upgrade in their tree. I'm not sure why Capcom did that for the dual blades, but if I were to guess, it would probably be because the dual blades were introduced in later development of the game. Now, obviously, I won't be talking about every single blade master weapon in the game because I would bore you guys. But I can safely say that the weapons are more or less balanced. So pick your poison and bring some whetstones because they're all fun to play with. And speaking of whetstones, let's talk about the important consumables of this game. I talked about whetstones in this game which are consumables and are not unlimited unlike in newer Monster Hunter games like in Monster Hunter World, but other items also include bug nets, pickaxes, and paintballs. These along with whetstones are consumables that you should grind for or buy at the market if you have extra zenny laying around. Paintballs are kinda common though, they usually supply you with them in every quest so don't worry about them too much. If you're a blade master, they'll supply you with mini whetstones which have the same effect as regular whetstones. For gunners, make sure you check the supply box at the beginning of each quest, since they usually supply you with bullets that you can take with you after completing the quest. Other supply items that they give you are first aid meds and rations. First aid meds and rations are supply items, later known as account items. This means that you can't take them with you at the end of the quest, but there are some items that you can. Paintballs, flash bombs, and sonic bombs are some of the items that you can take home with you. So stack up on flash bombs for the Rathalos and Rathian quests. That's a pro tip right there. Something that you should always be grinding for in this game are potions. You can make potions by combining a herb and a blue mushroom. You can buy herbs at the market or find them in your usual yellow flower gathering spots. The forest and hills map has tons of them. And for blue mushrooms, most mushroom spots give you blue mushrooms, so don't worry about it. To make mega potions, you combine a potion and honey. Honey can be found in one of the first areas of the jungle next to the camp. The combined success for a normal potion is 95% and the combined success for a mega potion is 90%. So I recommend you buying the books of combos that the peddler sells. Having combo books in your inventory will increase the combined success for every combination. The more books you have, the higher the combined success. Your combined success should be as close to 100% as possible. You don't want your grinding to go to waste, right? So please, buy the books of combos for the love of god. Something that you have to get used to in this game is to take out the items that you need to combine, since there's no option to combine in box. You can only combine in your inventory. Yeah, I know, it sucks, but it's the first Monster Hunter game, you know? Other important consumables and items also include antidotes, hot drinks, and cool drinks. And something that you not necessarily combine, but rather cook, are well done steaks. Be sure to stack up on those as well. And speaking about food, something that's important in this game as well is to fish if you're a gunner. I've been trying to avoid this, but I had to at least mention it. Thank god that I don't need to fish in this game. I won't be talking in depth about fish or insects in this game, but if you're interested in actually playing the game for yourself, I'll leave a link with the item list in the description. And that should cover most things about this game for now. I'm gonna talk about some stuff as we progress. I may skip some details, but if you're interested in the weapons and armors that I used, I'm gonna list them in the description of this video. But that's enough rambling for now, let's just play the game. After creating your character and watching the village's cutscene, you wake up in your house wearing nothing but your clothes and a basic sword and shield weapon. There's nothing inside of the item box, no items, no weapons and no armor, so you decide to go outside and meet the village chief. The chief introduces himself to you and gives you 1500 zenny, which is very generous of him, but we can only buy full leather armor at this point of the game. After equipping every piece of armor that I bought, I talk to the chief again and accept my first quest, which is a basic quest on how to find raw meat. I arrive at the camp and immediately check the supply box. I take all of the items that I need and sprint to the exit of the zone. 
After I make it to the other side, I'm greeted by the very first location in Monster Hunter history. The forest and hills. I then hack and slash my way to killing an Aptonoth. I'm still getting used to the controls at this point, so bear with me. One thing that I find weird about this game is that carving monsters is X instead of circle. It's a bit confusing at first, but I'll get used to it. After getting the raw meat, I rush back to the base and deliver the requested items, and also get the reward materials. After returning to the village, I complete every level 1 star quest, and just a small side note, I'm not gonna show you every single 1 star quest, because those quests are boring. But what I'm gonna do is show you the first urgent quest that the game gives you. Your first monster hunt, Slay 3 Velocipray. This is the first time we see these boys, and it won't be the last. And even though I was getting used to the controls at this point, Velocipray can be very sneaky monsters to fight. Especially when they try to gang up on you. They can very easily knock you over, opening you up for more of their attacks. The best thing to do with Velocipray and with any monster really, is to isolate the fights. This means fighting one monster at a time, always being aware of your surroundings. As you've noticed, having completed every 1-star quest really helped me with being comfortable with the controls. My first urgent quest was a piece of cake. Now let's get back to the village. Because of that urgent quest that we just completed, we now have access to more 2-star quests. But unfortunately, there's no more slaying quests on this star level. But there might be something different about this gathering quest. That's right, that's a Rathalos. This is pretty much common knowledge to everyone who has played a Monster Hunter game before, but Capcom's way of introducing the flagship monster to the hunter has always been pretty sneaky. It seems that it's always in a quest in which you're never expecting a big fight. It's a good thing that they supply you with flash bombs, because I don't think that I'd be able to survive a Rathalos attack at this point in the game. After entering the Wyvern's Nest in Area 5 and cleaning up the area, I collect the Wyvern Egg and then make my way back to the previous area. I noticed that Rathalos is no longer present in this area. Being very careful not to drop the egg, I hop down the ledges and sprint to the next area. In Area 3, the only monsters inside are Aptonoth. You can just imagine how relieved I was not seeing Rathalos in this area. We're so close to the camp now, there's only two areas left. These were the luckiest series of events. And that was first try as well. I'm actually flabbergasted. Stepping into Area 1 was like coming from hell and going straight to heaven. This has to be one of my luckiest moments ever. Delivering that egg was like having the golden ticket from Willy Wonka. Only you know how it feels like. And we even got a cut scale. Let's go boys. I then return to the village and decide to make a new weapon. I debated on making a greatsword first, but then I settled on a hammer. But now that I think about it, making a hammer wasn't the brightest idea ever. Even though the Bone Club has a lot of attack points, its sharpness is really bad. But it's okay though, I think I can work with that. The next quest isn't going to be that hard anyway. This next quest is special because it's our first big fight in Monster Hunter. The name of the next quest is the formidable Velocidrome. The Velocidrome is considered to be the pack leader, and he's the first drone that you'll fight in this game. Having only switched weapons recently, I had to adapt while fighting the Velocidrome and his minions, which is completely fine because I like to spice things up when it comes to using different weapons. The Sword and Shield is a perfectly good weapon in the beginning of the game, but I thought that using a different weapon would keep me entertained for a longer period of time. So what's my strategy with this guy? Ground pounding is always a viable strategy with drones, mainly because of the area that the attack covers. As you saw there, I tried to swing, but seeing as these monsters like to jump, 
Ground pounding is probably the best approach. This attack can hit multiple targets at the same time and can occasionally knock back the smaller monsters, making it way easier to focus on the monster that you're hunting. After the Velocidrome ran away, I chucked some potions and then I ran after it. At this point in the quest, the monster was really weak. It was just a matter of time before I slayed it. And there you go, your first big hunt in Monster Hunter 1. Good job, dudes. We have now officially entered the three-star quest territory. You should carve the Velocidrome, you might need his parts in the future, you never know. But good freaking job, you just slayed your first big monster. But it's all going to get worse from now on. After carving the Velocidrome, I got my rewards and made my way back to the village. Checking our newly posted quests, we noticed two quests that could trigger PTSD. One of those quests is Find the Wyvern Eggs, which is a quest where you deliver two Wyvern Eggs, uh, no thank you. And the other one is Liver of Legend, which is a really annoying quest where you have to kill Cephalos, this sand shark abomination that never gives you the freaking Piscean livers. You'll see what I mean later. Anyway, let's get a new weapon first. I'm gonna get a greatsword this time because it's actually my main weapon in most Monster Hunter games. And I think that I should play with the weapon that I'm most comfortable with. After farming a bit, I got an upgrade for my greatsword and I also bought some chainmail armor pieces. But let's get a bit serious now. Do you remember when I said that the game was gonna get harder? Well, it actually starts with this quest. The following quest is very important. Jungle Menace. Slay the Yan Kutku. The chicken is your very first wyvern fight. And also, it's your first bird wyvern fight. Bird wyverns are usually way easier to fight compared to other wyverns. But what's my strategy with the Yan Kutku? My usual strategy with this monster is to hit its head as often as I can, because it can result in a flinch, which can help a lot during this fight. Also, something to look out for is its tail. In older Monster Hunter games, most monsters like to spin like a freaking Beyblade, which can send you flying, and if you get hit by that a couple of times, you get dizzy. Watch out for the fire as well, especially when he's enraged. Also, something really important is to always use the flash bombs that they supply you with. Using or not using the supply items in the beginning of the quest can make or break a quest. And there you go. You slayed a Yan Kutku. You know the drill by now? Carve the monster, get your rewards, and let's go back to the village. I really wasn't looking forward to doing this quest, but unfortunately it has to be completed in order for me to reach level 4 star quests. The Liver of Legend quest takes place in the old desert. The main gimmick of this map is that the bigger areas give you heat damage, unless you have a cool drink or two. Each cool drink that you drink nullifies the heat damage for 10 minutes. But isn't that enough time to get the Piscean livers? Theoretically, it would give us enough time to get the Piscean livers if every carve was a Piscean liver. But unfortunately, Piscean livers only make up 60% of all carves from Cephalos, which is basically like playing a coin flip game with every Cephalos that you defeat, and also pair that with not having enough sonic bombs to make them jump out of the sand, and you have a really excruciating quest. Don't get me wrong, you're gonna get the Piscean livers, but it might just take up 30 minutes of your time. This is the kind of quest that makes you go insane. Hopefully we don't have to do this quest again. After completing that abomination of a quest, I upgrade my Bone Blade Plus to an Agito. Upgrades in this game are a tiny bit different from newer games. When you upgrade your weapon, you will usually have more attack power, but sometimes your sharpness will suffer a bit, and so will your wallet. So it's always a good thing to farm some Zenny as well. But in the meantime, let's check out that urgent quest. We've now unlocked the three-star urgent quest, the Land Shark. The Land Shark is a hunting mission in which you have to slay Cephadrome, the leader of the Cephalos. I've gotta be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of Cephadrome. And my main reason for not liking this monster is because it's just too heavily reliant on sonic bombs. So if you have a ton of sonic bombs laying around, just bring them. Also, bring extra cool drinks too. But the main strategy to fighting Cephadrome is to have sonic bombs. I cannot stress this enough. If you don't have extra sonic bombs, then you're gonna have a tough time like me. I'm just saying. Which reminds me that if you wanna make sonic bombs, I'm gonna leave the combo list in the description. But anyway, I only brought the two sonic bombs that they gave us. And there's two reasons for that. Reason one is that I didn't wanna farm sonic bombs. And the second reason is that I just wanted to complete the mission as fast as I could. Needless to say, 
that this fight was pretty rough. Do as I say, don't do what I do. Just get sonic bombs. And flash bombs don't work either. Like, look. Why don't they work? Why don't they work? So apparently, Plesioth, Lavazioth, Daimyo Hermitor, Shogun Cyanator, Gypsaros, and Cephadrome are all immune to freaking flash bombs. The only one that makes sense to me is Gypsaros, because he has a light crystal in his head. But hey, I'm not the developer, so what do I know? I'm just gonna skip to where he's almost dead, just so I can end this miserable quest. Cephadrome rests in area 3, which would be a great area to finish him off in, because it's a small area. But just look at how many monsters are there in this area. There's like 3 or 4 melinks, 2 felines, and like in 2 apsaros, it's insane. The fact that I didn't die and that I could actually carve the monster is actually freaking insane. If you slay the Cephadrome with just two sonic bombs, you're the freaking goat. I'm not saying that I'm the goat, but this is just another level of hard. This game is no joke. It doesn't hold your hand, it just punishes you because you're a bad boy. If you're not prepared for the quests, you're, you're gonna die a lot. But do you know what's the only positive thing out of all of this? We are no longer stuck in 3 star quests. We've now unlocked the 4 level star quests. Thank God. Anyway, let's get our rewards and go back to the village. As you might have noticed, I farmed quite a bit and got myself a full hunter's armor. I've also completed some 4 star quests and upgraded my dragon Agito into a golem blade. And now I'm ready to slay the next monster. And oh boy was I not ready for this quest. Slay the Gypsaros. The Gypsaros is a bird wyvern that uses a hammer on his head to strike a light crystal, making it spark and then flash. The Gypsaros' main attacks are his poison spit, tail spin, and a bite that can steal items from your inventory. The Gypsaros is one of the most annoying monsters in Monster Hunter history just by himself, but if you throw in 5 or 6 Bulfangos in the mix, rushing you at the same time, the fight can quickly turn into a survival mission. After slaying every Bulfango in every area that I could find them in, I then start fighting the Gypsaros for real, this time with no interruptions. The main strategy with Gypsaros is to try to hit his head or tail as often as you can. Hitting his wings does less damage, but sometimes it's better than nothing. But hitting the head or tail is the best way to go. Doing so can flinch him and we can get some extra hits in. Also, if you're playing with a great sword like me, you can actually block his flashback, which is pretty neat. And there you go, the poison chicken is down and we can finally rest. Slaying the Gypsaros wasn't that hard after getting rid of the Bulfangos, but boy are those Bulfangos for real. If you're struggling with Gypsaros, I recommend you making antidotes and maybe some mega potions, just to make sure you don't lose a lot of health in the areas that have Bulfangos and other stuff that wants to kill you. <laughs> anyway, let's get our items and check out the next quest. Returning from another stressful quest, I gear up and complete the necessary quests to unlock the 4-star urgent. In this quest, I need to slay 30 Vespoid. This isn't necessarily my favorite type of quest, but if we have to do it, then we have to do it. After killing my last Vespoid, a sudden realization sets in. We're now so close to beating the game, and I'm really having a lot of fun. After beating the 4-star urgent, we unlock the 5-star quests. That's the last star level of the game. My journey is basically coming to an end, but there's still a lot of grinding and a lot of monsters to kill. But anyway, let's not think about that, let's think about the next quest, which is... Attack of the Rathalos. We are screwed. After finally getting the poison axe, I gear up, get my items, and then let's go. Let's kill him. Let's kill the Rathalos. This is a real fight now, there's no going back. I hope you brought all of the items that you need. Pro tip, bring all of the flash bombs that you have, you're gonna need them. If you're having a real tough time fighting him, just remember, two or three attacks and then roll. Two attacks, roll. 
That's the main gist while fighting Rathalos. If he starts to fly, to do that poison attack that he does, just stand directly below him. He cannot reach you there. Also, use this opportunity to throw Flash at him. He will simply fall out of the sky and you can get a lot of damage in while he's blind. Do this enough times and you can basically kill him where he stands. Eventually, he will start limping and he will fly to Area 5. Once you get to Area 5, just keep hitting him until he goes down. And now you've slayed a Rathalos. Slaying a Rathalos is no easy feat, especially because it's your first real wyvern. If you're not prepared or if you mess up during the fight, it can really easily set you back. So bring all of the flash bombs that you have. But now that you know that you can slay a Rathalos, you're pretty much invincible. Take your time to carve his body and to appreciate your own work because you did a good job. Now let's get back to the village because the chief wants to give us something. Once I got back from the quest, I went and talked to the chief. Apparently, we did such a great job that he wants to give us his sword. I sprint to the back of the house and notice a sword stuck in a stone. So naturally, I pull it out of there. The sword has been there this whole time and I haven't even noticed it. Also, was that a master sword? Totally not a master sword, right? It's obvious that the developers were big fans of Zelda and wanted to show their appreciation for the series in a way that hopefully wouldn't piss off Nintendo. And I don't know about you guys, but this sword looks really sick. I really like it. Anyways, we've now unlocked the five star quests. I won't be doing the majority of the five star quests because I don't want to bore you guys. I'm only going to complete the big quests, like the Rathian quest and the Plesioth quest. So let's start with the Rathian quest first. After grinding for more weapons and armor, I gear up and head out for the Rathian quest. Now, there are two Rathian quests in the star level. One of them is Slay the Rathian, which takes place in the swamp, and the other one is the one that I'm doing, Queen of the Desert, which takes place in the desert, obviously. So let's start with the Rathian quest. If Rathalos is considered to be the king of the skies, then Rathian is its female equivalent. Having slayed Rathalos before, I was really confident in my abilities to slay Rathian. Just like the Rathalos, the best way to fight the Rathian is to use a lot of flash bombs. When they get flashed, just rush to its head and hit its head. Sometimes they'll turn into a Beyblade, so watch out for that. And watch out for the bites as well. Anyways, if you keep hitting its head, the Rathian will flinch. It will give you another chance to lay in one more attack. An exclusive attack that Rathian usually does is a backflip. In this fight, she didn't do that attack, but watch out for the backflip as it can get you poisoned. When she starts limping, she will fly to Area 3 to rest there. When you get to Area 3, try to distance yourself from the Apsaros so that they don't aggro. Having a ton of monsters coming after you can really make the fight harder than it should be. Just keep hitting her head and it should be done. And there you go, you slayed a Rathian. Good job. But don't be too happy about that. There are still some quests to complete, and one of them is everyone's favorite fish, the Plesioth. The master of the hip checks. So let's jump right in into the Plesioth quest. For the Plesioth quest, I'm using a lance this time, because I don't want to get hit by his hip checks. If you're having a tough time with Plesioth, just remember, you can always change weapons at any time. Plesioth is a lesson in strategy. You should always have an arsenal of weapons at your disposal. There are certain monsters that require certain weapons and certain strategies. Hunters should be skilled in more than one weapon. Monster Hunter has always been about this. Finding out why your current approach to fighting the monster is not working and then fixing it. That's why I chose the Lance. The Lance is a great weapon against Plesioth. Mainly because after attacking, you can sidestep into a defensive stance. Or you can keep attacking if he's not using the hip check. But even if you defend against the hip check, you're still gonna take some damage. So you gotta be careful. Also, I recommend you bringing Sonic Bombs. And if he keeps running away, just bring some frogs with you as well. Frogs are a bait used to fish Plesioth out of the water, if you didn't know. 
and I really don't care what anyone says about Plesioth, this was actually one of the best moments in my playthrough of this game. Just watching my hunter fish this big ass monster out of the water was a really badass moment, not gonna lie. Anyway, just poke him enough times and you got yourself a big dead fish. The hip checks are gone, now let's see what the next quest is going to be. Hopefully we're getting closer to Monoblos. The Bossarios is the next monster that we need to fight. Bossario sports a hard, rocky carapace which is virtually impenetrable, unless you attack his belly. His belly is actually really soft to slash attacks, so if you have a greatsword you can actually bring it to the fight. He can be found in area 2 which is only accessible if you come from area 4. This quest is weird like that. Throw a paintball at the suspicious boulder and the Bossarios will pop up. Now onto his moveset. Most of the fight will be you trying not to get poisoned by his poison gas, and also trying to avoid his high speed tackle, which is like one of the slowest moves in this game. Also there's a ton of Vespoids in this area that want to freaking kill you, so watch out for that. But if you're having trouble with fighting the Vespoids, use the Basarius' poison in your favor. Seeing as the Vespoids are really weak to poison, they will get instantly killed if they touch the poison. He also has a really rare move that he uses, which is the Lava Beam, but for some reason he didn't use that move in this fight, but watch out for that anyway. And just like every other monster in this game, he also does a hip check move, which is really original. I swear to god, every single monster in this game does that move, I don't know why. But yeah, just keep hitting Dwayne Johnson until he d <laughs> until he stops being the rock. Also known as, he's finally dead. Man, this quest was a bounce fest. You should bring a lot of whetstones for this fight. Please, please do it. Also, if you're looking for mechalite ores, he actually drops them, so yeah. Mechalite ores are actually really important for the last few fights. If you want to get good iron weapons, then you have to farm a lot. Instead of mining mechalite ores, I recommend just killing a Basarios or two. Anyway, let's go back. We might have a surprise for us this time. After completing the last 5 star quest, which was that Rathian quest in the swamp, I returned to the village and talked to the chief. This time, my intuition was right. The finish line is right there, I can smell it. One more quest, and we're done with the game. Which is kind of sad, but my main objective is almost over. Playing this game was really, really fun, but also really, really frustrating at times. If you're still watching, I just want to thank you for watching this video. It's been a really, really crazy ride. But this ride isn't over yet, we gotta slay a Monoblos first. There's a reason why the Basarios was one of our last hunts. Capcom introduced the Basarios first so that in the last fight you'd be warmed up enough to take down the Monoblos. Both the Basarios and Monoblos have hip check attacks and most importantly, the charge attack. The only difference being that the Monoblos has a really, really strong charge attack. So you better defend against that attack or you're gonna die instantly. Now for the other attacks that you have to watch out for, he buries himself pretty often in the ground, so make sure that you're always looking at him when he does that. Once he's buried deep in the ground, just run, but don't just run in the direction that he last saw you in. Always run at the opposite direction of where he's at. Once he buries himself out and attacks, that attack is his most powerful attack, especially when he's enraged. When he's enraged, all of his attacks deal a lot of damage, especially the digging attack that he does. His digging attack is one of the most powerful attacks in the game. Also, when he's enraged, all of his attacks are faster and stronger, so watch out for his tail attack as well. That actually deals a lot of damage, surprisingly. But what's the best way to fight Monoblos? Well, in my experience, you should always go for his legs. Attacking his legs can make him fall over, which will open him up for more damage. 
Never attack his head or yield bounce. The same goes for his wings and the pointy parts of his tail. And that's it really, just keep hitting him and he's gonna go down like every other monster. And that's Monster Hunter 1 for you guys. And that's technically the last offline quest in Monster Hunter 1 as well. I know that there are quests you can unlock if you meet certain requirements, but I think I'm done with this game for now. Something that I really find interesting about this game though is that most of the content for this game is locked in the online portion of the game. So like Kirin, Fatalis, all of that good stuff is locked away in the online multiplayer of the game. But if you have the Japanese version of the game, you can actually play Monster Hunter 1 online. There's even an English patch for the game. So if you're interested in playing Monster Hunter online, join my Discord server. I've made a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to set everything up for online play. But just to wrap things up, I just want to talk about why you should try older Monster Hunter games. Even if you think you won't like them. If you're looking for a challenging Monster Hunter game, I think Monster Hunter 1 might be the right game for you. The game has a short single player experience, but where the game shines is in the online multiplayer. As I said before, most of the content of the game is locked behind the multiplayer. And the quests are really, really hard. But if you have a party of friends with you, it could be really fun actually. There are a lot of monsters that appear in the online quests that simply aren't present in the offline quests. So give Monster Hunter 1 a try. Maybe you'll like it, I don't know. But maybe you're not interested in Monster Hunter 1. Maybe you're interested in newer games. I can think of at least three Monster Hunter games that are totally worth your time. Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, Monster Hunter Try, and Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. That's like the Triforce of old Monster Hunter games. Older Monster Hunter games have like a charm to them that newer games just don't. I do love Monster Hunter World, I, I really do. And it's probably my favorite game in the series. But the older games just have a certain aesthetic that I can't really describe. And the gameplay might be a bit too simplistic, but I actually really like that about the games. And hey, maybe in the future, I might make a video about Freedom Unite. Since it's turning 15 years old next month, I'm, I'm, I'm getting old. Right, so as I was saying, not having a lot of flashy combos and the writing mechanic that newer Monster Hunter games have, and the monsters being really difficult even for Monster Hunter standards, can be something that can turn off some people from playing Monster Hunter 1, but if you get it, you get it. That's what's so special about Monster Hunter games, you know? There's a game for everyone. And I've been rambling a lot, but I just want to thank you guys for sticking with me throughout the whole video. So yeah guys, that's the video. It really took a while to make this video, but it actually turned out way better than I thought it would. Also, like I said in the beginning of the video, if you'd like to support my channel, my Discord server, YouTube membership stuff, Patreon, all of that stuff is in the description. Anyways guys, thank you so much for watching and have a nice day.